So, uh, hello everyone again. I'm Anthony Ferris, an MFA print student here at Edinburgh University. As a graduate assistant in the Bruce Gallery, I'm here to welcome all of you to our Wednesday night webinar. Due to COVID, the university's Bruce Gallery will be dark most of the semester. So we at the Bruce Gallery are organizing a series of events every Wednesday night at 5.15. The Wednesday webinars may be as short as 20 minutes. It said 5.15 there, but we're starting at 5.30. Um, the Wednesday webinars may be as short as 20 minutes or as long as two hours. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Cameron Ross. Ba, ba, ba. Uh, Sorry, let me, one sec. Of course I'm moving things. Oh, damn it, one sec. Sorry guys, I, I, I'm reading. I had to pull this up, all right. Um, Cameron Ross, an interdisciplinary artist who attended Solon High School, Solon, Ohio. David K. Ross is an undergraduate, undergraduate student studying sculpture at the Cleveland Institute of Art. At the September 2020 Sculpture Act Symposium, you guys might've heard him talking. Um, and he's in his third year now and we'll take it from here. Awesome, yeah. Um, let's see, is there a way for me to yeah, share screen? And then I have a, a PowerPoint. Um, are you, is everyone seeing my screen right now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm uh, David Ross. Um, so I live and work in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm currently studying sculpture and expanded media at the Cleveland Institute of Art. I'm 24 years old, which makes me a non-traditional student, um, a little bit older than my classmates. Um, before coming to school, I was working as a machine operator in a steel processing plant, and that's something that's informed a lot of my work. Um, so to give a little preface for my work and um, you know everything I'm interested in at the moment, um, these are some of the ideas uh, inherent to that work. So the proliferation of the internet uh, and its usership brought with it abundant potential for communication and mobility free of governmental or institutional control. Uh, however, today these possibilities have been diminished by the very forces which the internet sought to circumvent and the reality of surveillance and tracking is omnipresent. Uh, the theorist Byung-Chul Han describes this era as that of the digital panopticon. With this background, I would like to share some of my current recent and work uh, and in progress work. So this is um, from a group of work I'm calling surveillance pylons. Um, so these are structures that uh, adopt the um, iconography of surveillance, sort of past surveillance being these CCTV housings that are equipped with more modern camera modules that are capable of um, face recognition, face detection, um, so this one here is, is meant to sort of represent the chimney in an, an industrial building, um, sort of something that you'd find fixed to the top of a, a brick structure. Uh, I believe I have a video here as well that sort of, sort of shows the motion. So this is actually the first iteration from that series. Um, this one is sort of without the moving parts and the camera module is, is only representational. Um, it has the capabilities, of course, to be 
you know, activated and actually serve as a functioning camera, but this one is not. Um, this one was made more to sort of be hidden in, in nature, so to speak. I was sort of bastardizing the idea of um, like a real tree camo, like field camera for hunting or, or tracking or something. Um, something that I'm thinking a lot about with this work is uh, coming to terms with without fetishizing surveillance and certain aspects of um, surveillance in that industry, which is one that can't really be separated from the military industrial complex. It, it's, it's absolutely, you know, a product of that, that there's all of these um, technologies and devices that are readily available to the mass consumer public because of, you know, uh, the interest of, of war and that sort of thing. So that's something that I, I think about a lot. I haven't quite come to terms with, and I don't know if I ever will, but I definitely want to get it on the record that that's something I'm concerned with. So this is um, a work, a very recent work, actually. This was probably finished within the last month. Uh, recently, I've been working a lot with actuators, small linear actuators to um, you know, bring what would be more object-based sculpture into uh, a more contemporary realm. I think I have a video here as well to show some of the motion. Um, we got a question. Uh, Lisa's asking, what is an actuator? Sorry, what was the question? Um, what is an actuator? So an actuator is a small motor, essentially, but instead of creating torque, it creates, um, I don't know what the mechanical word for it is, but it, it creates a, a stroke instead of spinning. Um, I, I was looking at this one earlier today, um, and I was I'm curious when you say object contemporary, how do, how, do, how do you feel the integration of this linear motor transitions this piece into more of a contemporary versus the object? For sure. Um, well, I think that, you know, sort of by definition, though the technology of small DC motors or actuators isn't necessarily something that's like associated with the 21st century, it's, it's probably a little bit older than that. Um, to sort of give more of a like corporal association to these objects, um, giving the stone itself some agency as to rise and fall, I think is, is bringing it into the realm of, um, you know, contemporary discussion. Um, but of course, there, there also is the aspect of incorporating technology in a sculpture that is hitting, you know, some of the, um, the checks of like what traditional sculpture is being like wood, stone and metal um, to incorporate like very deliberate moving parts as opposed to something that's ordered by gravity, like, um, um, well, I can't believe I'm blanking on this like very huge figure of art history, but the guy who makes like this spinning sort of mo mobiles. Um, oh, no, uh, let me see the chat who is like a very, very famous artist. Do you, do you guys, you know who I'm talking about. I can't believe I can't think of his name right now. That guy. So to sort of make something move in a way that's not typical of like canonical sculpture, um, I think is bringing it into the modern age. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know much on sculpture, but- uh, For sure, yeah. no problem. Um, I'll head over to the next piece here. So this is a recent piece of mine that was very ambitious and super challenging to make. This took about five months, I think. And even in its completed form, it wasn't working exactly how I hoped it would. Um, but this is the CV conveyor. CV is standing for computer vision. Um, the idea here is that this 
a uh, system of conveyor rollers was started. It, it began spinning when um, a face was detected in the video feed. That information was then disseminated uh, by a projector right below the conveyor itself. Um, as you'll see in the next in the next slide, there's a video that sort of shows there is some, not all of the rollers were rolling at once, um, but you know the reason this took so long was because I had to um, familiarize myself with some coding and different coding languages I had no idea about. Uh, the software for recognizing faces is, is um, it was written in Python, which I had to sort of teach myself the basics of to, you know, try to, to augment in a way. Um, that software is called OpenCV and it's available uh, open source completely. So anybody can create these modules um, to do, you know, facial recognition and detection and all sorts of things. Um, but I'll go ahead and get to the video here so you can see what that, what that looks like. So if there aren't any questions immediately, um, and by the way, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to just jump in. I'd like this to be as conversational as possible. Um, I also think it's in the nature of the software that I'm using being very open source and um, that sort of thing that I'm, I'm very open to helping people navigate these softwares and these camera modules and face detection and, and things like that if they're interested. So. Um, I, I have a question, but I uh, just write it in the chat because my English is not that good. So maybe you can just read it. Yeah, I can read that. Um, okay. It's kind of an issue. Okay, thanks. Over here. Um, I can't open messages. Uh, I'll... I can read it here. It says, yeah. um, Clement writes, but David, I saw a lot of your works. There was always construction. Now, in your recent work, you're using machine. What is the things that made you use the machine? And he also writes, we can also think about a rapport between human and the machine, a kind of man automization. Sure, yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I think I think that utilizing machines is a way to create, of course, robots that are more um, installation on their own, uh, which is something I'm interested in. But um, I don't know. I think that it's a way for sort of. I mean, we were talking about this before a little bit for more contemporary issues to be addressed, and I think there still is definitely an, an emphasis on construction. Um, and I think that construction in sculpture only serves as representational unless it's activated in a way. And I think by adding these moving parts, it, it, it's helping in activating that. I have a little slide later of some video work um, and you'll see it, it was, you know, my, my work from a year ago is 100% object based. And I always wanted to find a way to activate that and bring it into a, a different realm. Um, that usually resulted in me inadvertently sort of breaking those objects, trying to place them um, or situate them how they would be, you know, if they, if they actually serve the purpose of what they're representing. So I'm trying to find sort of a space between representation and functionality wherein there's, there's um, some statement being made or some idea to consider. Um, and that's a pretty good segue, actually, and get into some of my more object-based stuff here. 
so this piece is from 2020. It's called Double Suspension. Um, this is sort of a, a, a system of balancing uh, things. There's this seesaw here that is held up by this other um, structure. And this is sort of emphasizing precarity and, and balance, of course, and sort of a, a delicate relationship between these things. Um, I've always been really interested in, in ordering sculptures um, from the ground up and relying a lot on gravity to sort of hold things together. Um, you know, not, not to the extent of like someone like, like Richard Serra, for instance, but um, I think there's still something really captivating about things floating in space, even if the hardware and the fixtures are like very much part of that experience. Um, there's also this stone here on the end of the seesaw that is, is meant to appear as if it's floating. Um, this is a, a rock from Iceland that my brother brought me after he spent some time there two or three years ago. Um, here's a, a detailed shot of that. So this here, um, municipal building from 2020, as well as that uh, actuator one, the stone rising and falling, that was using um, Berea sandstone. So Berea is a city in Ohio and their sandstone is, is very much part of their, um, you know, industrial history. It's, it's what they're known for if you are evaluating cities or, or regions on that level or by that criteria. Um, their sandstone is sort of, you know, important or big to them. Um, so in this iteration, I was, I was interested in the idea of municipal buildings or what makes a municipal building. Um, so I thought eventually I came to the conclusion that, you know, a, a hose connection or a source of water um, is something that might define buildings as municipal. Um, so this is also sort of a play on gravity with these stone, with the stone elevated above the other, and then having that hose there. Um, some of the cracks in this stone are filled with expansion cement as well. So those little uh, white areas on the top stone, that's, that's what that is. These are, um, so I guess I should say, a lot of my work from two years ago was uh, largely in cement. And I would make these sort of cement paintings as ex like material um, explorations, trying to see the different colors and, and uh, saturation and hues and things like that that I could get with cement and polishing and um, really just physical processing of it and trying to see what would happen. And I got some really interesting results, I think. Um, I was really drawn to cement then because of the way that it really softens or makes um, sort of like pastel um, the different colors and additives. Um, I always really like using natural additives. So like rust or iron oxide or aluminum pigment. So this is another one of those pieces as well. And they're coated in epoxy, which is why they have that sort of shiny finish. So this is what I was referencing earlier, where bringing into um, or, or activating these objects sometimes resulted in them being broken. Um, so I was making these threaded pieces, um, like conduit with threaded uh, bases and nuts and bolts that actually did screw into each other. Of course, they didn't like hold much weight and they're very brittle being cement. Um, but this video is sort of the process of, of finding that tensile breaking point. Um, so next I have some videos of some stuff in progress. I have um, an installation coming up at the Sculpture Center in Cleveland. So this is uh, some of the video stuff that's going to be part of that. Um, as I said in my introduction, I was working at, in a steel processing plant before coming to school and I, you know, oftentimes would be like daydreaming a little bit, looking at all of this infrastructure around me and I don't know, just trying to get out of that headspace a little bit. Um, 
so I was always thinking about that idea. And this is sort of the first time I've, I've tried to make it an actual like thing that exists digitally. So are you like using maybe um, like found objects or you always like make them? Because it's like a like different report, like to have maybe found an object and maybe, because I know in my, uh, in my work, I use a lot of like found objects. And when we see maybe your uh, sculptures, um, they seem a little bit like founded. I don't know if you understand what I mean, mm -hmm. but, and it's, I, I think this is really interesting because, so I just want to know maybe your report, if you like maybe uh, see some objects and make them again, or like if it's, you, you see what I mean? Totally, yeah. Um, so with the things that are cement, those are absolutely reproductions and they're, they're cast and, and molded and that sort of thing. Um, but for the larger stuff, it's all, it's all pretty much made from, from the ground up. Um, I don't do a lot with like representational found objects with like branding and that sort of thing. Um, and it's not to say that I, I'm you know, averse to that. It just doesn't really happen that often. Um, I think there is, I mean, it's like, it's like Walter Benjamin's whole thing with, with recreating objects. There, there's absolutely like something uh, with artistic merit that happens when you're recreating a found object. And that's always appealed to me um, instead of just taking something that, that it, you know, is an object in its own right. Um, I think by recreating objects, it opens up an opportunity to sort of reevaluate like the use value of those things and also embed mm -hmm. your own meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Sure. I, I have you. a question uh, based on the way you're using objects too. Um, what, what do you think of the familiar, familiarity of the viewer with the object and the connection between object and action? Um, okay. And have you thought of further abstracting forms while maintaining the materials used as to limit familiarity? Totally, yeah. Um, so I'll work in reverse order. I definitely have thought of um, further like augmenting the, the forms and stuff. And I was doing some work um, probably a year and a half ago with actually bending the latex forms for cement while they were drying and re-pouring um, in steps. So I could take those like long um, bolts or like rebar. I did a lot of rebar. And um, when it was all finally dry, if I was very careful and taking it out of the mold, I would have like a curved um, sort of shape or elongated in a way. Um, I think that, you know, opened up a, a whole avenue of, you know, ways to make these very common things more dreamlike, I guess, beyond just the, the surface and density and like color being changed by them being cement. Um, yeah, I was definitely very interested in, in that in like, you know, messing with the form a little bit more than just recreating the material. Um, but I, I don't know, I sort of, I guess I, at this point, I have really stopped working in, in cement for small objects, um, just because it's really messy. And yeah, I don't know. Um, and then I'm, I'm sorry, the, the first part of the question was like human interaction or familiarity with yeah, like, you, know, you, you see an object and like if like I see the threads on your piece I'm thinking screw you know you're, you're playing like with uh because in, in your talk the other week you mentioned object and taking object and pushing it past the object because of a constantly changing world and how objects are you know kind of in the mix of that and right so I was just thinking um you know, taking that and if you push it past the point where you will, you can't recognize it, you know, is that something that would, you'd be interested in? I worded it, um, what do you think of the familiarity of the viewer with the object and the connection between object and action? For sure, okay, yeah. Um, I, th I always thought that familiarity with the object was really important. And I really, I, I tended to choose things that were pretty much ubiquitous and mostly within the realm of hardware Though, I mean, I made like a lot of small objects, like like, you know, like lighters and um, 
but I really just like to sell and raise money for our practice. Um, I was recreating different stones or like parts of, of concrete in cement for a while. Um, and that, that was sort of deliberately to blur the line uh, of what is familiar, I suppose. But um, the relationship between like the threads, for instance, I always wanted that to appear as thread for the purpose of like being able to make that video, like the clip I showed where it's pushing it to its limits, it's utilizing the threads, um, but it's ultimately not, not working as the original would. Um, during my, my talk for the actual Sculpture X symposium, I was talking a lot about um, like, how's a good way to word this? Like, so if you think of like the, ev the evolution of like construction materials and building things in terms of like animal evolution, making hardware out of cement would be something that's like vestigial at this point. Like maybe in some world somebody tried it and for whatever reason it didn't work. And I was trying to maybe highlight those reasons a little bit. Um, but I was also creating like the possibility that this could exist because it had like some function to it though. Shortly after trying to like activate or like use those things that function was, uh, you know, rendered. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and then I guess the last note on that would be, um, cause I, I feel like you're focusing on the infrastructure and I mean, it's, it seems like you're, you're completely moving but you're focusing on infrastructure and the, medial uh constructural the evolution of constructural material i'm mm -hmm. curious like what have you thought of using like technological material as as the base like phones taking apart phones or mm -hmm. you know, automated systems and yeah taking medial aspects of that and blasting it totally um i definitely have considered that though i try to stay away from being at the intersection of art and technology, because I think that's sort of like a, a catch-all for a lot of things that um, it's not as direct as I would as I would like to be. Um, I'm more drawn to taking apart the non-physical infrastructure of technology, like software and uh, different things, like like how I'm triggering sculptures with non or with like intangible technology and intangible commands to technology um, than I am the actual like infrastructure physically of the technology. Like a lot of the moving parts sculptures are made in a way that they, they, they power up by um, like motion being detected or proximity of the person to the sculpture. Um, like light, for instance, if, if a door is open, they're pro they'll power up. So I'm more interested in, in taking apart the like technological or like um, not, not the technological, but the like electric aspect of it, like inserting myself between the power source and something happening, um, taking like that, that connection apart and inserting a viewer or, or myself, you know, or any third party to that process. Um, all right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I really like what you're doing with the, the way you're taking apart you know, a small part and you're putting it in another place and you know completely changing the dynamic perspective. Yeah. Um, I was just curious when you mentioned the changing world and the way you treat the object and in such a way that you want to reset represent the changing world it just made me think technology is so you know so in our face and i'm i'm always constantly thinking like how should i should i possibly be integrating that because it's such a big part of the world right now yeah it's something i think about a lot especially dealing with issues of like surveillance because i feel like um some of my favorite artists are trevor paglin and hito steril and they are to me, and I think to a lot of people, they're sort of like the authority on making art that is about surveillance in a way that's not like, like I mentioned earlier, in a way that's not like fetishizing it. It's like actually beneficial to um, the public, you know, like the working person. It's 
it's sort of bringing light to the issues, which is easy, which is, I think that's maybe where I'm at right now is I'm able to bring light to the issues, but the, like these people are able to really like make it a conversation and actually offer some critique. It's very hard to make work about surveillance when you're, you're literally going up against the military industrial complex and you really only have, um, you know, if you're only thinking inside the box and like very rationally, you only have at your disposal the the tools and instruments from that whole industry that they don't need anymore because they're onto something else, you know. Um, would you be able to uh, put those two names in the chat? I wasn't able to get those. Uh, those uh, yeah, I don't know if I have access to the chat right now, but I can real quick. Oh, if you can tell me again, I can type it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hito, H-I-T-O. Yeah. Sterile, S-T-E-Y-E-R-L. And uh, Trevor, T-R-E-V-O-R, Paglin, uh, P-A-G-L-E-N. Okay. They are absolutely two of my, my favorite artists. So what examples from them would you say um, impacted you the most? Or like just one, one that really sticks out when you're thinking of those artists? And sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, Trevor Paglin has a really, really cool series called, I think it's called Black Sites. Um, and he makes these uh, lenses, these like telephoto lenses that have like a, an extreme capability for like distance, like far distance. And he documents like military black sites that really don't exist on any maps. Um, and they're really, really like blurry images, but you can see that there's something. He does the same thing with like, um, the physical cables that run on like the ocean floor that are transferring data between continents. Um, and I think, you know, that that's a critique on if something doesn't exist on a map on like a digital map, then it doesn't exist, uh, you know, in our time when everything can be searched and its location can be found and we can like map our, ourselves to it. Um, but I think like, I don't know, I think it's very provocative. It's It's like, he, he, he did this other thing um, at the Tate where he made a, um, a modem, like an internet modem for people at the museum, just to be, you know, if you're around it in the museum, you could be running on a, a tour, tour browser um, to be virtually undetected online, which is something that, you know, we have all these connotations of like what the, the dark web is, but, um, I think people are really surprised to find themselves like on it or taking part in that and realizing that it wasn't as nefarious as media makes it out to be and that there were, um, you know, there could definitely be some benefits to that. Um, and Hito Steril makes some of like the most captivating installations of like anybody that I know working. She's like very, very comprehensive. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that they're, they're really, really great. So what he, what, uh, the, the first artist that you mentioned, the way he's photographing these these bases and stuff, it seems he's going out and, and looking for the literal, you're, you're kind of abstract, well, using the concept of surveillance and taking a, a critique yeah. on that. Uh, could you go into where you deviate from him? Or like um, where your, your take on surveillance is changing? Yeah, totally. I, well, I definitely am like at, at the moment, at least I have like high hopes of maybe working on that level someday, but I'm, I'm, you know, definitely sort of capitulating at, you know, for right now to um, just like the, the access to technology and grants to come up with that technology that, that people like Trevor Paglin have. Um, you know, I would, I would love to devote myself to like working on a scale or framework like he is, but um, I also think that I, I'm, you know, really deliberately trying to incorporate like a, a, a craft, a craftsmanship and, and sculptural aspect that, you know, he, he's a, he's a photographer, I suppose, if you had to put him into a category. Um, I'm not a photographer, but I'm interested in similar things. Um, and I think it's, I mean, I think it, again, is really difficult to navigate that world without fetishizing it and without sort of becoming part of 
the problem or, or not being part of the problem, but making a statement that really like falls flat because um, you're not changing anything. I mean, I think it is important to like bring attention to issues that are, you know, very present and everyone should be aware of. Um, and maybe that's more where I'm at right now, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a, the whole issue with, with surveillance. I think it should be attacked from multiple angles. And what he's doing is very literal. And what you're doing is it's taking it and taking it a different way, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, so this here is uh, I, I have an installation coming up at the Sculpture Center in Cleveland. Um, I've been making these screens out of fiberglass and using them as rear projection screens. They have this like really weird sort of surface that captures light in an interesting way. Um, these mock-ups were made by my friend, these digital uh, mock-ups here were made by my friend Austin, who's uh, sitting here with me. So thank you, Austin. Um, he is in black and white, so you can sort of see the shape more. Um, so these are some other media installations. Um, I'm, been interested in, in not necessarily like a disregard of technology, but a, um, I guess like democratization of technology, if that makes sense. Um, so this this screen is made with, um, was it just like plexiglass that's been processed to be more matte, to capture more light. Though with COVID and people making sort of dividers like in restaurants and stuff, the the price of plexiglass has gone up like 400% in the last year. So I haven't made any more of these though. I would really like to, I think that the way it captures light and serves as like a, almost like a TV screen um, can be really, really interesting. This is a smaller one of those, the same sort of material though. Um, and I think next is just this screenshot from a video, again, working with screens and sort of augmenting what's on the screen and uh, pushing the screen to be more of just a component as opposed to the final final product. Um, I also have a link to my website and my Instagram. And like I said earlier, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk and you know try to help anybody who's interested in, in any aspect of my work and you know help them bring it into theirs in a way. Uh, I mean, specifically with like the technology and stuff. Um, so thank you very much again for inviting me. Thank you, Matt, for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Um, does anyone have any more questions? This will be the time to ask them. I'm not seeing the messages come in. Um, so I think that that's all. I think we can cut it a bit short, unless there's anything uh, else you want to put in. Um, no, I think that's, I think that's it. Um, Awesome. Can you tell us a little about your show? When is it going to open at the museum? And I and I see yeah. a new question in the, oh, okay. comment in the chat. Yeah, totally. Uh, that's opening uh, May twenty first. It's the night um, of one of their the Sculpture Center emerging artists, uh, Kylie Ford, I believe, is the artist. Um, so it, it's going to be opening in the courtyard um, between the two buildings of the Sculpture Center that will house her exhibition that that night it'll be open that weekend um from sundown to about 10 o'clock i think there'll be more details on my uh on my instagram in a few months i'm looking at the chat now it's alexander calder thank you lisa can't believe i forgot alexander calder earlier um all right so thanks david again and uh adios everyone have a good night all right thank you thank you Thank you.